sometimes I get excited. So first, thank you so much for having me. This was a wonderful way to spend my last um, end my last day in Moscow. It's been an amazing trip, and um, my first trip to Russia. And uh, yeah, it's been the hospitality has been amazing, and all the excitement about virtual reality and and uh, the innovation and uh, entrepreneurialism that I see is, is really exciting. And so I just want to thank you for for having me. So this is um, I was invited. Uh, by Spokolov to come and present on virtual reality. So this is the presentation that I gave um, on Monday there. And so I was asked to give it again. If it bores you, just tell me and we'll move on to something else. If you start yawning, I'll watch and then I'll know, go faster. Um, yeah, you want to just, it's fast. So, um, so there's a new drug. And it's really, really, really powerful. It's, um, it's being used to treat depression and anxiety extremely successfully. It's being used to comfort the elderly in their last days so they can experience some of the things in life they didn't get to do while they were able. Um, it's being used to treat fears or phobias of heights, of spiders, of public speaking even. Um, it's being used to treat post-traumatic stress syndrome in soldiers returning from battle. It's being used um, to treat phantom limb pain in amputees, which is amazing. Um, it's even unfortunately, or well, maybe fortunately, being used to teach teachers how to deal with active shooter situations in schools, which is a bit terrifying. It's being used to teach people how to cook chicken. And if you eat too much chicken, you can actually use it to exercise, to lose weight and get fit. Um, I recently got to go to the Egyptian pyramids and to see inside the pyramids from the air-conditioned comfort of the Architecture Museum in Paris, France. Um, and it's also being used to travel inside your mind and to hack your consciousness through meditation and mindfulness applications. Um, it's also a party drug. And, uh, it can help you dance better, make you want to dance, and it can even make you a better lover. So that drug is highly addicting, like many powerful, powerful drugs. And because of that, there are companies spending billions and billions and billions of dollars to try to get us hooked. They're giving it to school kids in schools. People are using it at work. And even the military and police are using it all the time. And you don't have to take a pill or use a needle, they just beam it right into your eye. Um, it started out really expensive, but it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And pretty soon, you're gonna get as much as you want for free. That drug is virtual reality. <laughs> um, and soon it's gonna be everywhere. And um, it started out, actually, in the early 80s, the concept was born out of stereoscopes in, I think it was 1836, so 170 some odd years ago. Um, and then in the 1930s, I don't know, I grew up with one of these, it was called the Viewmaster, and this was unveiled at the World's Fair in 1936, and it was the ability to look at fantastic images in 3D. Um, and then in the 1950s, they created this thing called the Sensorama, and this actually used wind and smell and vibration and a 3D video to create a really immersive environment. And then, later in the 60s, this is called the Sword of Damocles, which if you studied the you've probably heard of. And they called it that because the way they suspended it, it looked like it was like, if it fell, it would take the user's head off. And this was by Ivor Sutherland. It was the first VR headset um, that was considered kind of VR. Now looking back on it, and then this is the um, this was the very first iPhone, E Y E phone, um, and combined with a data glove, this actually allowed you to manip manipulate the computer environment. Now, while that was all going on, I was starting one of the first laser tag companies in the world, 
um, and was the, one of the first people to take movie IP and apply it to an out-of-home amusement business. So we did, we had X-Men from, um, from Marvel and Stargate, one of the bunch of best products awards. And as, and as I was launching this company, I was able to, you're a really good remote control, thank you. I could use you, Laura. Can you come with me around the world and do this? <laughs> um, so I had the opportunity to launch a couple of virtual reality products. And what we did was we built VR arcades with laser tag um, in malls in 1992, 1993, 1994. And this is a product called Virtuality. And it was really the first publicly accessible VR product. Um, and the helmet is, you know, was really, really heavy, as you can imagine. And it was 8-bit graphics, and you turn your head, and the environment would go, do, 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 you have to wait for it to catch up to you. Um, and it uses a magnetic ring for, for tracking. But it was amazing, and people lined up to, to play it, and when we launched it, we had media from 100 different companies at the IAPA show in Orlando in 1991, 92. Um, lined up to there. And then later in the 90s, in 1998, I helped start a company called Global VR. And this is really the first VR product that took off and was successful. We sold over 2,000 units. And what we did was, what we did was, um, because of the heaviness of all the optics that we needed, we mounted it on a counterweighted boom. And so you'd walk into it like a periscope. And we sold it as a platform where you could have multiple games in it. And it did okay until we found this one game, Stay there, um, called called Beachhead 2000. It was just a turret shooter. And it was simple and accessible. Two buttons, one fired missiles, one fired machine guns, and people loved it. Up until then, we spent a lot of money porting PC games, first person shooters like Skin and, um, and Battlezone, and all of these really expensive games for the home back into this arcade cabinet. But they were, the, user, the user mechanism were too complicated. And when we dumped it down to two buttons, Revenue took off, people bought it, couldn't get rid of it. Now, after global VR, VR kind of went to sleep for a little while. And what happened was the smartphone revolution happened. And there were three components of this business that made VR what it is today. So one is the LCD screens got way cheap and way small and high resolution. The second one was that um, cameras got really small, right? And tiny and cheap. And then the third one was this thing called an IMU, or inertial, inertial measurement unit. Um, and that's what allowed you to use your phone as a controller or a compass or to tell you where you're going. And so Paul Lucky, as you guys probably know, did a Kickstarter. He put those three things together into the first modern VR headset called the Oculus um, Rift. He raised a couple of million bucks, which at the time was the, most, the, the, the top earning, um, what do you call it, crowdfunding campaign of all time. And, uh, and there was a guy named Mark Zuckerberg that was watching, and he was really concerned because Facebook, when Facebook was a, basically a web product, right, when it first launched, and the PC, the, the, the window, the, the smartphone revolution happened, and all that web usage went to smartphone, and they missed it. They literally were late to smartphone. I don't know how many of you guys are even old enough to remember what was going on back then, but, they, um, but the first implementations of Facebook were just on a browser, they were terrible, and their usage fell to the floor. And so what Zuckerberg realized was that um, if he doesn't control the platform, right now Apple and Google control the mobile platform. So one day they could wake up and just shut it off access for all of his customers to, to his platform. So he said, I want to own the next computing platform. And he thought that virtual reality was going to be that, and so he spent three billion started out at two, it wound up being $3 billion on Oculus Rift. Um, because he believed that we were gonna spend all of our time in VR at some point in the future, and he wanted to be there. Now, some of the statistics around social media, on average, we spend two hours a day, more than two hours a day on social media. How many of you are more than that? Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, and 80% of that usage is through our smartphone. 91% access VR to a smartphone, no, no surprise there, but 80% of the time we spend is through the smartphone. So this was an existential issue for Facebook. Um, and so he basically went all in. And, uh, and now, their 
goal, and we'll get to the goal of, of, of Facebook, but there's also other companies now. By, now, do you guys have Netflix here? You do have Netflix here, okay, cool. Um, I wasn't able to access it through my internet connection, I guess. So, um, so Netflix is not the only movie platform. Are you guys seeing what's happening with Disney Plus? So um, Disney Plus is launching at uh, the end of this month. Apple TV Plus is launching as well. All of these media services are kind of trying to take that two hours to four hours to six hours to eight hours and competing for our eyeballs, right? How many of you play Fortnite? The average Fortnite user spends two hours a day playing Fortnite. Um, and it's not just a game now, it's become a place. Like right? it's a place where people hang out and gather with their friends. So it's almost become another social network. Later this quarter, Google Stadia is gonna launch along with tests from Microsoft xCloud, GeForce Now, um, and Apple Arcade's already launched. And these are streaming gaming services. And so you'll be able to play AAA PC games like Halo on a mobile phone or a tablet, anywhere you go, all powered by 5G, which is coming now as well. And so the amount of content and the quality of content that's coming to our devices everywhere we go is a bit overwhelming. With 5G, you'll be able to download a movie in four seconds. It used to take 24 hours, not too long ago. So these are Western stats, but You'll see, you'll see the, that um, on average, we're spending between 10 and 12 hours a day interacting with all kinds of media. Now this is everything from radio, terrestrial radio, television, internet, apps, etc. But And it's going up every quarter. It's actually been increasing even now by three to five percent a quarter, which I don't know where we're finding the time. And, um, and so in his book, Russell Brand, who's a, a comedian and activist, he wrote about his own recovery. By the way, if you have not listened to the audiobook version of this, you should get it if you can, because it's amazing and hilarious. And one of the things that he talks about is the loop of addiction. So the first thing we do is we, addiction generally starts with some sort of pain, right? And it's usually an emotional pain. And what we do is we turn to things that distract us. So we turn to alcohol. Um, we turn to sugar. This is one of my bad ones. We turn to food or sugar. We turn to, um, some people turn to pornography. Some people turn to work. How many of you feel like you work too much? Uh, <laughs> especially in, in the entrepreneur world, right? There's so much work. And then what happens is those become distractions. Like we don't know what else to do, we don't want to be really comfortable, so we'll just do some more emails, right? Um, and those distractions then turn into negatives. So we're either hungover, or we gain weight, or we're disconnected from our partners, or we're burned out at work, right? And then what we do is we feel shame, we feel further pain, and then we turn back to the thing that we wanted to be distracted with again in the first place. And that's called the addiction loop. And, um, and so there's some research recently about VR and how it affects pain. So at UCLA, at Senior Sinai, they've recently been testing VR instead of drugs and opiates for, for patients that are hospitalized. And what they've found is it's just as effective, if not more, not only for short term, but for up to 72 hours after it used it, which is a a bit, a bit crazy, actually, to be honest with you. Now, the NHS recently released a survey that said one in three people are addicted to something. Okay? And in his recent book, another great book, Gabor Mate said that all addictions are really about that internal angst that we feel. That's what starts it. And so if VR can distract us from pain, as well, if not better than opiates. What happens, can you imagine how effective it would be against some of the psychological pain that leads us to addiction in the first place? Okay. So now Mark Zuckerberg, back to Facebook, said, I want a billion people in VR. A billion people. Now, he didn't give a timeline, which is good, because it's gonna take a while, okay? Um, and what that reminds me of is the Matrix. How many of you have seen the Matrix? Okay, cool. Now that was supposed to be a metaphor. 
Um, and in the Matrix, Neo was asked to take the red pill or the blue pill, and if he took the blue pill, he could stay happily numb where he was, and if he took the red pill, he would then be exposed to the reality of the world, right? Um, and so he, of course, takes the red pill, and he goes in, and he realizes the computers are taken over, and they're using this to harvest our bodies for the energy they need to, to run their networks, right, for electricity. So we became power generators. Now, what Facebook is doing is they're harvesting us not for energy, but for our eyeballs. Because they sell our eyeballs to advertisers for $2 to $50 billion a year and growing at 35%, right? And so they have an incentive to keep us chained to our phones. Now, what happens when that's VR? And it's gonna be VR. Because VR is amazing, and it's doing amazing things. And it's important that they make it amazing, otherwise we won't go in there and stay in there. So it's being used for education. There's some amazing stats coming from the educational world. So this is, by the way, if you don't follow Alvin Wang Graylin, who is the president of HTC Asia, um, HTC Vive Asia, follow him on Twitter. He's amazing, and he's constantly posting these statistics. And this is from him. So this is from a recent um, study that showed kids are six times more focused in concentration in VR. <clears throat> and this is the part that's amazing. So the, 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 app, the best students, okay, went from B to A, but even the shitty students got B pluses, which is more than the best students got without VR. So that's in VR, that's not in VR. So even the, the students that were lagging did better in VR than the best students doing the test without VR. Massively, massively powerful for education. In language learning, VR improved language learning 2x and improved the self-confidence of speaking 10x. And this has been interesting for me here. So many people in Moscow speak great English, but they're afraid to use it because they're a little embarrassed by it. They don't think it's as good as it is. And, and so this confidence in speaking, the way you learn a language is you speak it. 10x more confidence, I find that fascinating. Um, the other place we're doing it is work. So this is, so NVIDIA, this is their holodeck, they, they called it. And it's designed in a big capture space, similar to something like this. And you can come from different places and collaborate. Now, Bell Helicopter, one of the biggest helicopter co companies in the world, just produced a case study this year that showed they brought this concept from concept to flight in six months. Normally, it would have taken five years. Ten times faster because all of the design and engineering work was done in virtual reality. Now, in America, we spend $700 billion a year in wasted productivity commuting. We spend $800 billion a year in rent to house office workers. And we spend almost $50 billion a year to maintain schools, school buildings, just maintenance on school buildings. And so even without VR, remote work is increasing, 15, it's 100, up 150% over the last 12 years, right? And, and so, if you take all the money, the trillions of dollars in capital that's being wasted on us going to school, going to work, sitting in an office, driving back and forth, and you combine that with the effectiveness of virtual reality as a collaboration tool, as an education tool, as a concentration tool, it's absolutely obvious that we're gonna be spending a lot of time in VR, right? In fact, it's inevitable. So, so what does that mean when we actually, when we spend our lives in virtual reality, when we're working in virtual reality and we're learning in virtual reality, we're already starting to play in virtual reality, right? Well, this is where we go back to Facebook. Now, in 2014, Facebook ran an experiment around emotional contagion. What they wanted to do was they wanted to test to see, and they took like 700,000 users and they monitored their posts, whether they were happy or sad. And then what they did is they boosted those posts to see if the people who were friends with those people 
would then post happy or sad stuff themselves. And they found that they were ab absolutely able to manipulate this cognitive state of their users. Right? And then a few years later, they were busted telling advertisers, they give them a report to certain advertisers who say that we know when teenagers are emotionally insecure and are most able to be manipulated to buy products that might make them feel better. Right? And then you guys have all heard about this, right? Yeah. right? So we have proof that they have been manipulating us. And now, now in all, I'm picking on Facebook and I don't actually need to. I'm a Facebook shareholder, by the way. I've invested in Facebook and, and you know, because if you can't beat them, join them, I guess, to a certain extent. And if they're gonna destroy the world, they'll profit from it, then go back. Um, but advertisers have been manipulating us since the beginning of advertising, right? I mean, it's not just Facebook. But the, the problem is an advertiser has never owned the computing platform that we're gonna live inside. And that's the part that really, I think, we need to be aware of. And so this gets you back to the matrix. Right? If they can manipulate the reality in which we are spending all of our time, what happens? Now, Cypher in the Matrix said, I know this steak isn't real, but the Matrix tells me it's juicy and delicious. Right? And he wanted to go back and taste the steak. And the challenge with VR, as amazing and juicy and delicious as it's going to be, is we're going to want to spend time in it. And so we have to be super aware of ourselves and what we're getting ourselves into. All right, so do you pick up the phone? Do you get out? Do you stay in? I don't know, I don't know how it's gonna play out, but I do know that in order to maintain any semblance of humanity, we're gonna to need to be conscious. And we're gonna to need to elevate the conscious of everybody that we're with, really of the planet, to be able to withstand this trend that is coming. Um, we're going to need to hold space for our friends, for our family members, for our co-workers. We're going to have to create our, um, empathy. We're going to have to really be in touch, maintain this physical, this personal connection, and fight the resistance to constantly be connected via social media. <clears throat> we're going to have to build a reflect. How many of you have a reflection practice? So, um, everybody needs to have a daily reflection practice. Like if there's one thing that we can do to make the world a better place is to have a, a meditation and reflection practice where you sit there and you reflect back on what you're feeling and why you're feeling it. Because that's how we beat the addiction. The need to addict, that, that addiction need is really based on our own angst and our own pain and the psychological trauma that we all carry from being human. And the only way to fix that is through reflection. And if you do that, we can maintain you know, a state have a better level of consciousness and a better world that we can use VR as a tool for good and not succumb to the people who are going to want to use that to entrap us in a media platform to sell ads so we buy more shit because that's, that's kind of the world we live in. So, um, yeah, or you can just take the headset and put it on and join the matrix. So, yeah, that's... Um, that's a bit of my, my mantra these days, is just trying to build awareness for people. Because a lot of people, hey, most people don't even know about VR still. I know we're in it, and so we're in a bubble. Um, but when I talk to people about VR, they, go, they still say, what's that? I get that nine times out of 10. Um, and so, you know, I think within the VR community, what I'm trying to do in the technology community is open the eyes to, you know, the various ways it's being used, positive and negative, because everything has balance. Um, yeah, so that's it. VR isn't dying, it was the problem is it was sold as a consumer product. And it's not a consumer product, it doesn't solve a problem for consumers yet. 
And everybody, and I think the companies that built them saw Xbox and PlayStation and Nintendo and, and all of these gaming consoles and said, oh, this is gonna be a great gaming console, we're gonna sell it as a gaming console. The part that they didn't understand, and had they asked me, I wrote a white paper about this in 2016, all they had to do was ask. Um, remember Xbox Connect? The, the, the sensor, you can play Xbox? It was the fastest selling piece of consumer electronics equipment in history. So the 87 million years, in like that period of time. And it failed because you had to move the furniture around and it was a little bit awkward. And VR is a lot awkward, you have to move the furniture around and it's kind of, it's been a pain in the ass to hook up and set up. And there's not enough games, and, and, and. So it has a lot more headwinds as a consumer technology than the fastest selling consumer technology in history that failed and that people still let it have in their memory. But it's working in places, and all the places that I talked about and more, it's working amazingly. And so what's gonna happen, and I think similarly, similarly go back to the smartphone, um, the reason the smart, the consumers were ready for smartphones started with the Blackberry. So the Blackberry taught us, the email one, taught us that we could get email away from our computer. And once we had email away from the computer, we said, well, why can't I get everything on the internet away from my computer? And you started to see smartphones and web browsing happen, and then when the iPhone came up, people were like, oh my God, that's exactly what I want. And so I think that VR in business, in B2B applications, in medical applications, in therapy applications, in a million little micro-vertical markets, will expose us to the power of VR, all of the consumers. And then when they come up with, you know, the VR headset that isn't totally awkward, that has good pass-through video, that has some better long-form games to it, um, that maybe creates more social connection, like you know, Facebook is working on photorealistic avatars, and there were, you didn't see that in the video because I had to turn it to PDF, but Facebook Lab Labs is working on photorealistic, real-time deepfake avatars, and they're amazing. And I put on a headset, but you don't see the headset, you just see my face talking to you and vice versa. So that virtual telepresence, you know, there's so many things that are coming, and at some point it's gonna click over. But I think we're five or more years away from VR as a consumer product. And what do you think about, like the kids, they already live in the virtual world in Fortnite. Yeah. Do they need the actual No, headset? they don't, which is why they're not buying it. Yeah, that's the thing, you know, because I, I'm also trying to fit in this LD world, and I realize that for the kids, there is no big difference between Putting the headset on, or just watching on the on the flat screen. Yeah. So, but when they but when they're at school and they're using it to learn physics, right? Or they're using it. There's a, there's a, a friend of mine in Dubai has created a game. It's a job simulator, but for mathematics. And so you go in, and you're, one of the scenes is you're in a pizza place, and you have to cut the pizza to learn fractions, and you serve pizza, right? And so when all of those applications in VR, they're doing VR frog dissection now in a lot of countries because you can't, they don't want you dissecting real frogs. So when they get exposed to it and they realize how amazing it is, like if you give a kid a VR headset and you set him off to play Beat Saber, he's gonna play for a while, right? It is amazing, right? It's amazing. But the problem is the parents aren't buying it and, they're not, and the kids aren't exposed to it. They're gonna get exposed to it in school and that convergence is gonna happen where they're all of a sudden, they're comfortable with it, they're used to it. And by then, they'll be able to play with their friend. Right now, there are no good social experiences in VR. I don't think. Fortnite is a social experience. If you had a social experience that was amazing and your friends were there to play with you, like if the Marshmallow concert was in VR, with, you know, I think that, I think that would have been good. And so I, I think it's gonna happen. It's just gonna take some time. Yeah, good. I, I'm not sure, you know, but just I'm, I'm going to ask you because the, the yeah. kids, kids live in a totally different world right now, yeah. So, and so many things happening, like in, with, with, like with the Netflix and Fortnite and everything. So, why VR should be, like, in, in which way VR should be better than than the flat screen, uh, you know, all these streaming services and uh, yeah. all that stuff. So, I think, first of all, it's 3D, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, 2D versus 3D. So 3D TV failed, right? Because what happened was, this is a good question, thank you. What happened was, the, the awkwardness of wearing glasses and the discomfort, 7% of the people got headaches with VR. 
wasn't enough for the benefit of 3D TV, because 3D TV wasn't actually that much better. It was a novelty, right? And a lot of the VR stuff, the early VR stuff, was a novelty. Um, but 3D, in, from an immersion standpoint, real, true 3D, is truly amazing. We've all done it, that's why we're here. Um, and if, lost my train of thought, sorry. I got side, I lost my train of thought. I just, <laughs> my brain just reeled off. That was good. Um, <laughs> so why VR, you know? What, yeah, 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 what, what, why, why do kids care? So, so 2D versus 3D. So the first thing is it's 3D and it's really immersive. But it's not so old. It's isolating technology. 80% of the people that have been surveyed that are aware of VR ask what they want. They said they want social experiences. And so the ability to connect with people in a 3D environment where you're not distracted from your distraction, which is kind of weird than that, right? Um, I think that, look, I don't guarantee it. I say that the, the stuff's going to get much more comfortable. In 2020, you're going to start to see pancake optics hit the, hit the market which is gonna shrink the volume of a headset by over 50%. Um, and so within two or three years, you're gonna see really thin optics, not glasses, but much more comfortable goggles that you can wear for many hours without discomfort, streaming 5K or 4K or 8K video via 5G. Um, it's gonna like, holding on the top of the smartphone, like if just that, it's, it's kind of, your arms get tired, right? And, the ability to strap that on your face, the problem with it is the experience isn't as good as what you have now. Have you ever watched Netflix on Gear VR? It's fucking terrible, right? You can see the pixels. I don't want to see pixels when I'm watching television. Like that was 20 years ago. And so the optics have to catch up, the comfort factor has to catch up, and then you put on top of that 3D immersive social experiences, and I think you're gonna be, you're, but, but it's up to the creators to figure out what the use case is. Right, that's the part that's, so the technology has to catch up. But I'll give you an example. What would have happened if oil paints weren't around in the time of the great Renaissance painters? That was the invention, right? What would have happened if the piano wasn't around when Beethoven was born? So the invention enabled the art. When, when Steve Jobs unveiled the iPhone, did anybody envision Uber? No. Right? And so VR is now the tool, and the artists and the creators, the creators, entrepreneur to me is the ultimate creative endeavor, um, have to figure out what to use it as the technology gets better and better. It's just going to take time. And the problem is, everybody expected it to happen overnight. And there's a term called macro myopia, which is what Gartner turned into the hype cycle. But that term has been around for decades, way before Gartner. And it, the concept is that technology often has a much bigger impact than you expect, but it always takes much longer than you expect. So we get so close to it, and the hype is so big, we focus on it, and then when it doesn't live up to our short-term you know, expectations, we just forget about it, and we go look elsewhere, and the next thing you know, it's everywhere. And VR is clearly one of those technologies. So we just have to try? Just Trying to find the, the, the right location well, here and there. And, and, there. and this is the challenge. What you have to do is you have to find business models that will pay you and buy runway for your business, mm -hmm. right? Because the problem is everybody built games for the consumer market that didn't happen. And so all of a sudden, now they're like, shit, we don't have any money when we do. And they, they pivoted to location based because some people were buying tickets and there was some cash there, right? And so now you've got this rush into location based VR. And that space is getting really crowded, and it's really hard to carve out a market niche and, and, and make money in that space now. Um, and I just think that you know there's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of people who don't make that transition because they are not around long enough for all that stuff to con converge. So you have to find like a little niche. I was just at um, um, uh, was it beyond beyond reality. Where was it? Anyway, um, and they, they were going to build a chain of VR arcades. Mm -hmm. And they built the first one here in Moscow, and, um, and they went, oh, this is too hard. And so now they're building um, industrial training applications. 
for it to, to buy, to, to generate revenue, to buy time until the market develops more and they can get back to what their passion is. And I think we all have to, if you want to stay in it, you just got to hold on and find a way to make money in the meantime. And what about AR and all of this? Because the time was in VR, like some time ago, and right now it's moving to AR. Yeah. And the people trying to do the same thing, trying to find a business model, and it's much more part of the devices there. Yeah. So do you think it's uh, it's going to be like a big shift to AR, or it's going to be two different so, technologies? So I think there's two, There's and I think we have to start like segmenting AR. There's mobile phone AR, and then there's glasses AR. Right. And I think the mobile phone AR is kind of a novelty or proof of concept, right? And I haven't seen a business model around that yet. Like advertisers are playing with it, and virtual watch, virtual shopping, and it's all shit, and the experiences are terrible, and they're never gonna, nobody's ever gonna make money. The advertisers, agencies who build them might make some money, but I think that that's, you know, they would call it Pokemon Go AR. It wasn't AR, right? It was like, it was just a pass-through video with a little floating, um, a little floating thing, and, and it captured, it's really interesting. In order to build a consumer product, you have to tap into an innate need. And the thing that Pokemon Go tapped into was the innate need of parents to spend more time with their kids. It was that basic human need that made Pokemon Go work. It had nothing to do with AR, nothing. It was, it was, it was the game, but the game filled an even deeper need to get kids out of the house and parents could play with their kids and do something that they could kind of get their head around. That was the power of Pokemon Go and why it was successful. And then they use it and then you read the analyst reports of, oh, you know, AR generated $1.2 billion in revenue and, you know, Pokemon Go was 900 million of it or something ridiculous. Um, and so I think the mobile phone based stuff is, is silly. It's silly. I think the, the glasses stuff, when it happens, will be. Real, like everyone's gonna want it. Like everyone's gonna want a pair of glasses that you can wear if they're comfortable and get notifications and, and directions when you're walking. Because we're all walking down the street all the time doing this. All the time. I have photos of people. Like 80% like of the people in any major city are doing this when they're walking with headphones in, right? So if you put that on a pair of glasses that are comfortable and have battery life, everybody's gonna want it. Everybody. Now there's rumors, really strong rumors that Apple is going to release those in 2020. No way. And if I'm wrong, just call me on it. Like they don't, like I don't believe the tech is there. And if they do, unbelievable. Like I'll be shocked because for them to bring something out like that before it's really ready would be stunning. Um, or they've made it ready, which means they've invented some core technology that's going to be mind blowing. And I hope they do. And I hope they nail it. But I think when that happens, and then what's going to happen is a lot of people said that VR, that AR was going to be the next big computing platform. I actually think it's going to be the other way around. I think that AR is going to be the consumer technology. And ultimately, VR is going to be the thing that occupies all our time. These will be the training wheels for virtual reality. When everybody in the world is wearing AR glasses, and then we give them a really good immersive headset that allows you to be fully immersed, it's going to be way more comfortable and people are going to be used to it. So I think AR glasses will be training wheels for VR and the Matrix, and that's what that's how they get us in there. Now the other thing that's really scary about it, and this was another slide that got skipped over because it was video. So Facebook just announced that they're building live maps. Have you heard about this? Live maps? So the reason they're building, everybody's building glasses, and the glasses are going to have cameras, and the cameras are going to map everything in the world right down to the chair you're sitting on. And then the, the next person that sits here is going to see the chair is not there. It's going to change the map. They're calling it live maps. It's really innocuous. Like, what could be wrong with live maps? We love maps. Maps are wonderful. Live maps have to be better. What they're building is the matrix. That's how they're going to build it. They're going to give everybody glasses, right? And they're going to map everything in the world. And they're going to build a 3D replica of the world that they're going to be able to project onto your view. That's the part that woke me up. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, so by doing that, they're going to give us really accurate direction to be able to give us contextual information. The combination of that and 5G and AI and voice recognition, it's going to be amazing and everybody's going to want it. Yeah, it's going to happen, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's fine. Like, I believe that that vision, though, is less than five years away. 
I think you'll, in five years, you will have 3D map version of the world being built. Obviously, you're gonna get everybody to have the glasses first. This is the chicken and the egg. If they don't wear the glasses, they can't map the world. But they have to map the world how they didn't have glasses. Right? So they have to figure that out. They have to come up with a feature set for the glasses that gets everybody to buy them or wear them. And then once they do that, they start mapping the world. And so within five years, everyone will be wearing AR glasses. And then five years after that, the world will be mapped. And we will live in a virtual world when we're out of home. When we're in home, we'll have that virtual world without leaving. And so we won't actually have to leave home. We'll just put on our VR headsets, which will be better than the glasses, because the resolution will be better. Right? And we'll actually be able to go out into the virtual world without leaving the real world. And then what does that do to industries like transportation, or tourism, right, or clothing? The whole fashion industry? Fucked. Because we already seen it in Fortnite, people spend a billion dollars a year in outfits, right? So there's no reason to buy clothes, we'll just wear our baggy jeans in the house, or in our underwear, and we'll be wearing our digital Armani suit when we go out to the virtual nightclub. Like, I know it sounds like science fiction, like it's all happening, in all of that is actually happening right now in different places. It just has to converge in VR. And it's, it's, it's gonna happen. Will it connect people more or yes. disconnect them more? It will, it will connect people more, and that's, that's gonna be the hook. Mm -hmm. The hook that Facebook is using is it will enable us to have this experience, but I'll be hopefully on a beach in Hawaii where it's much warmer and the surf is better. <laughs> right? And I'll be sitting up here, and they can already do that now with, you know, motion capture and, and, and virtual telepresence, but, but you'll, you'll all be able to do it from the comfort of where you are, and it's going to bring people together, there's no doubt about that. And that'll be the hook to get people in. That's the hook for Facebook, right? Why are we, why are we in Facebook? Because we have all of these friends that we want to stay connected to that make us feel better, right? That's the hook, and it gets more and more powerful when you're in it. And talking about like the closest future, like, what, should, what areas should we, should we as a developers, as a entrepreneurs? Yeah, if you, you want to make money now, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I would, all right, so really good question. Thank you. Um, I think there's a couple of areas. First of all, um, so I want to talk about storytelling, and I want to talk about, um, I want to talk about, um, Talk a little bit about social and, and the interactive theater. So, any of you in here consider yourself storytellers? So the problem with storytelling in VR is we're still telling stories from 2D screens. When I sit in a theater and I go to look at the screen, it makes sense to me I'm watching somebody else's story. It makes sense, right? When I step inside of an environment and I'm in the middle of it, and I'm sitting, floating on top of a dinner table, listening to a whole bunch of people have conversation, the first thing that occurs to me is like, why am I here? Deep down in me, it makes no sense. When you're in, when you put somebody inside the environment, you need to let them experience their story. Let them be the hero of their journey. If you haven't, if you haven't read um, Hero's Journey, what's his name? Um, I'll think of it. Um, so I just did a game from Anvio. You guys all familiar with Anvio VR here? So they have a new zombie game, and I went to test it out, and on and their thing is you have to turn on generators in each level. So you go into the level, and there's a level that's dark, and you turn on the generator, and you're in a nightclub. And all of the disco lights come on, and the music starts sounding, and the lights are going, and it's like bright and neon, and here come the zombies, right? And the zombies are coming, and you're shooting zombies, and blasting away at the zombies. And then, all of a sudden, I noticed that there's a couple of go-go dancers <laughs> with a dance pole, dancing zombie dancers, on, over by the wall. And I'm in this trigger-happy state, and so what do I do? I shoot one of the girls. And I felt terrible. I'm serious. I felt shame. I still do. Three days later. I actually still feel shame. Why did I shoot that poor innocent zombie girl? She wasn't attacking me, she was no harm to me. She was actually entertaining. That emotion was really freaking powerful. Like today it still affects me, it will affect me maybe forever. So 
I don't think they know what they did. Like when they built that, I think it was just a joke. Hey, let's put some zombie go-go dancers in there. But what they did is they created an opportunity for me to learn something about myself, maybe something that I'm not too happy about, that triggered emotion, which is why we want to be entertained in the first place, right? And so when you're creating games or telling stories, you need to create the environment. All you can do now as a VR storyteller is create the environment in which people can tell their own story. And if you do that, you'll change the storytelling forever. That's the opportunity, and nobody figured it out yet. That, like, that was the first one I saw. I was like, I don't, and I had to, to point it out to them. I don't think they did it on purpose. I think it was an accident, which some of the best inventions are, right? Those little sticky notes that we put everywhere. Oh, actually. Do you need a PR for that, or all this is great yeah. games?